just giving us a kion, you know, a taste of what's to come. Um, so I sifted through 277 responses of the um, Google form. Um, and so he's going to answer a bunch of your questions this evening. Um, but before we go into that, I'd like to introduce myself. Hi, everybody. The, f the room is full. I don't think it's been full for any, any other of the talk. Anyway, I don't want <laughs> to say anything about the previous speakers, but this is really uh, a full room. Yeah, so um, people are really excited that you're here. Um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for really um, being who you are. I think when people let their light shine, then they give people, give other people the permission to let theirs shine. So thank you. Um, so, and thank you to the audience for joining us. I think it shows such great commitment to your own development. And I hope this uh, session is everything that you expect for it to be. So we'll jump right into the questions. Um, I know that this audience is a mixed bag. It's not just medical students. There's students from dental school. Is there people from dental school? Just by show of hands. Okay, is there, there is, oh, there we go. Thank you, thanks for coming. There's people from pharmacy school, I think. Yay, yeah. yes, clap for their medics. <laughs> and then there's people from nursing school, is there? Oh, great, great, Karibu. And then med labs, is there med lab students? No? Okay. And then I think the majority of us are medical students across the board. Yeah, so welcome everyone. Yeah, so I think, Doc, you started from far along your journey, med school. Um, but I think, and many of us will agree that, I think home is where, where people become, what they become. Um, so maybe just take us back to your childhood. What was that like? Um, were you a rich kid? Is that how you, <laughs> you made it in life? Just to be honest, I'm an ego. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just tell us where did you grow up? What 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 that was like? Um, what your upbringing was like? And then your education pre med school, and then for med school, I mean, you talked about um, your business pursuit. Sorry, I'm just so that you answer many questions at once. Um, but yeah, what was medical school like? What did you enjoy? Were you an A student? Um, yeah, all of that. Just tell us. Okay, thank you. Um, I was born in a hospital called Homer Bay District Hospital. That's where my placenta was buried. Uh, my mother was 18 years old at that time. Uh, the parents could not raise money for her to go to her A-levels. But she had got Division One. That's like an airplane at that time. And so when she got Division One, Barclays was just setting up in Kenya. And so she was hired by Barclays Bank as a clerk. And so my mother rose in the banking industry from a clerk to by the time she was being retrenched, she was like a branch manager. Um, <clears throat> being born in Homer Bay, I think, when people hear your parents worked in a bank, they think you owned the money. That's not the reality. Uh, initially, my mother lived in a two-roomed house. Uh, we were not poor, so to say we were poor is a lie. I had a decent life because my mother provided uh, what I needed to be comfortable. And then from there, we moved into a three-roomed house, so bedroom, bedroom, living room, and like a small kitchen in Homer Bay. If those people who know Homer Bay, there were staff quarters for a school called Sango Academy. That's where I went for my primary, second part of my primary school. Um, that time we were two boys. Currently we are five children, uh, four boys and one girl. My mother was married as a second wife, uh, so my father had 11 children, uh, seven, 12, seven and five, yes. So 11 siblings. Um, I was the book type of guy when I was growing up. My brother was the playful type. So he would always break windows out there, break the neighbor's bicycles because you didn't have bicycles. He would always climb trees and come back home with injuries. I was a clean one, always in the house, reading a book. Nothing 
dramatic to talk about. So I did nursery school for one year. That was when I was five. I went to Omabe Primary School, so from class, four, class one to four. Uh, nothing dramatic, only one incident where we ate bad meat. And I had a running stomach, and of course I couldn't control. And I pooped on my shirt in front of the whole school, and my self-esteem was messed for a very long time. And I could not talk, and so that made me even more shy and drew me more into my books than anything else. And so to prove them wrong, I proved them wrong by becoming better in class than anything else. From class four, I went to Sango Academy, which was now a private school. Five to eight, um, would walk home for lunch, come back in the afternoon. There were boarders and the day scholars. I was a day scholar. Became a boarder in class eight. Um, nothing much. Being number one, number two to four, oscillating in between those positions. Finished my KCPE in 1999. Went to Maseno School. No, I was called to Nairobi School. But then my father said, I can't come to Nairobi because I will Ntaribika, you know. Kukitoa paka uko ocha uilete town. Itaanza kuzunguka kila mahali. And so he said, I'm not going to allow you to go to Nairobi. So I stayed at home for about three weeks when everyone had reported to school. Because my father was a high school head teacher, so he was trying to talk to his colleagues to see which school I could get. But he was told, wait until we see those who will not report. So finally he comes home with this calling letter for Maseno School. You look at the calling letter for Nairobi School, vis-a-vis -vis the calling letter for Maseno School. It's like heaven and earth, stark difference. One is a duplicating paper, asking you to come with a slasher and a hockey stick. <laughs> the other one is purple, pink, yellow, different colored letters telling you to come with a cricket bat and, and cutlery and laundry bag and pajamas. I'm like, what's going on here? And swimming costumes. And you want me to go to this other school instead of this school? I'm like, no, you're playing with me. And then he stamped his authority. And I think I thank him where he is. May his soul rest in peace for that. Day. So I landed in Maseno School at 4 p.m., 4 p.m., Three weeks later, and I enter school where everybody's running, and you think, what's happening here? Is there a fire? And they're all running in different directions. I got confused. I'm like, what's happening? You know. But that was Maseno school. When the bell rings, you start running. And you run whichever direction you're going. So I just entered when people were going for, for games, and they were running. I'm like, Aye, okay. You know, because you're not used to that. But that was Maseno. So I'm late, and so I get, I panic. In the first exam of my first Form 1, in my panic, the devil lied to me, and I sneaked some papers in the exam room, because I wanted to cheat. And one of my desk mates snitched to the teacher, and I was given a very hard slap. I have never forgotten. Some decisions make you. And I thank him for having snitched, because had he not snitched, I would have thought that is the way to make it in life. And so I was number 139 out of 200 and something for the first time, even after cheating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the shame of having cheated, um, in my second, from se second term, I came and said, I will show these people that I am not stupid. And I became very straight. I was a chapel boy. I would go to the church in the morning. At lunchtime, I, just, I literally prayed the number of times I ate my meals. And read books. It was library, chapel, hostel. Library, chapel, hostel. Until the chapel captain chose me as a chapel boy. I would clean the pews, serve Holy Communion. And that's what nurtured my religious. So I'm very close to my God until to date, and I've never forgotten that. So I came from number 139. In my second time, I became number four, <coughs> without cheating. And I never looked back. So that was Maseno School. From chapel boy, I became a letter boy or a newspaper boy. I became a, a, a senior boy, for those who understand the <coughs> administrative structure of Maseno School. 
Then I was chosen one of the top five. Top five is like the big cabinet boys. The ones who when they walk somewhere, people shiver and fear. <laughs> and in my lean body, the school saw it fit to make me a dining hall captain. <laughs> For reasons I do not understand. But in retrospect, I think God was preparing me to be a person who can do events and logistics and organize things. Because I had the mandate to feed a thousand students in 30 minutes. Lunch break was 12.30 to 1. You need to be seated in your classes from 1 to 2 for the after lunch prep. Then your classes start at 2. So as a dining hall captain, I had to feed 1,000 students in 30 minutes with three cues. And we made it work. And so that's where I was nurtured to be a leader. <coughs> from Maseno, I go back home to Homer Bay. I was a very good accounting student. We are those people who, when you're lifting your head fast, Maxwell is walking out of the room. And you think he's going to the washroom, but he's finished. So you just give, you have to give that panic to your competitors, you know. And so I said I want to, I literally wanted to do become, Because my mother, having worked in a bank, the newspapers I would see was all the CEOs of banks. And I wanted to be a CEO. And so being a CEO for me, was doing BCom, MBA, you know, CPA, because that was a CV I could see in the newspapers I used to read and the magazines. Uh, Adam Mohammed, Martin Oduo Rotieno, Awonda, if you know those names. And so after that, uh, I said I want to go to Strathmore, because Strathmore was the end thing. So I find my way to Strathmore. That is the first time I come to Nairobi looking left, right, and center like I don't know where I'm going. My mark and point of reference in Nairobi was Nation Center. So if I get lost, I would find my way to Nation Center and then start figuring my way around to Madaraka and Langata Road. So I went to the, some hostels in Madaraka around about classic hostels. They're still there. So that's where I started life. So I did my CPAs. Um, Strathmore is a good place. It was very structured, very good. Then 2005, I come to University of Nairobi and I find a whole different lot. Do you, the world will adjust, nobody cares. So how, <laughs> how did we go from uh, wanting to be a CEO to finding yourself in a... Oh yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. So um, when results came, I got an A play. Top 100 in the country, top 10 in Nyanza province. There's a part I've forgotten. So during that time, uh, Nation Media took us for a talent search program. Uh, it's like a placement for the top students across the country. Kiboro, who's the chairman of Family Bank, that time was the CEO of, of Nation. And so we were taken to KCB training college, we were told. So we worked in Nation Media across all departments. Printing, press, distribution, newsroom, everything. So I know how the media works top to bottom from that experience. But my father asked me, what did you choose? I told him I chose BCom. I said, no, you can't do BCom. He said, why? He said, how many students do and graduate BCom in a year? We started calculating the number of universities, and we found at least 2,000 graduates every year. That's on a conservative level. He said, have you thought of being a doctor? I said, no, never. But he said, no. There are only 98 students being selected for medicine in the University of Nairobi. And there are only 98 in Moi and 100 and something in UON. So every year we only graduate 300 or 200 doctors and they are guaranteed a job. So my son, go persevere and become a doctor. Once you become a doctor, get a job, then you can do what you want to do after. And being real to myself, it made sense because I saw people were still tamaking with their becomes. I said, fine. So that's how I ended up into medical school. And that's the second decision I thank my father for having made for me. One was Maseno School, then the second one was this one for medicine. So yeah, I'm in UON. We are in houses. I don't know whether they're still in houses. First years were in houses next to state house. You know, you feel like you're gods. But you have to walk the trek. You don't need a gym when you're a first year regular. You used to call them reggae boys. You know, so you walk all the way to Millennium Hall. It was two or one? Two. 
Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out Nairobi. At least Strathmo gave me a preview of Nairobi, but now I'm in the CBD. So every evening we are walking in town. And me being me, I'm, I'm more of a discovery type of person. I want to know more. I want to discover more. And so I found myself knowing Luthuli, Kirinyaga. I would discover things that students don't know. And that's where I would be a broker. I connect you with your problems. I find solution to your problems. And so, yeah, we partied hard. Uh, I was not the bookworm type of guy. I would go to ADD for about 30, 40 minutes because everyone was going to ADD, basically because of peer pressure. But I needed to read, so let me not lie to you. Don't follow me when it comes to schoolwork. I might mislead you. You have to understand and know yourself, right? Yes, I work better in the morning. I would wake up at 5, read till 7, sleep a bit, go to class. And that's what I needed. Uh, group work was not my type of thing because it gave me a lot of pressure. But towards the end, I needed to do it. Looking back, maybe I should have started earlier. would have really helped me. Yes, they really come in handy, uh, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, so that was med school. Yeah, so, so you finished med school. And so I'm in final year of med school. And we're done in about seven weeks. So... Your seat, where did you say you used to sit? There. There, where, yes. the, yeah, where the girl is sitting in glasses. Mm. So a few weeks to finishing school, what was the plan? What, what was the, I mean, everyone who's, like, I'm about to finish school, and I know I have a big plan in my mind, um, and it changes, but what was the goal? Like, what were you, was it still, were you still pursuing the CEO dream, or were you um, going to be a physician or a surgeon? Um... I think I still needed to be a CEO. <laughs> I don't know. I kept saying I would rather be a CEO of cobblers. Really? You understand? I mean, how many people use the service of a cobbler? Do you know it's an industry that's not tapped? Can I give you the figures today? Assuming you change the sole of the bent sole shoes for all men in this room and charge them 1,000 shillings, how much would you make? You understand? Everyone, so I see some people looking at their shoes. <laughs> because there's a problem there that needs to be sorted, right? Yes, and that's what businessmen do. We solve problems of our daily lives. So cobblers, nobody has professionalized cobbling. For the longest time, cobblers are left for that guy who people without ability. You understand? Seated somewhere, either in a wheelchair or something. And can we professionalize cobbling? Make it a decent thing that I know today if my shoes need something to be fixed, there's this brand called Shoemax. You understand? So you have a Shoemax shop that you can take your shoe and they're fixed. Is there such a business? We don't have. So if you have money, you throw your shoes. If you don't have money, you look for that person in a shop somewhere in a veranda. So that's what I thought. That, I mean, I could always professionalize this. And also have a very professional... There are people who buy blue shoes, purple shoes, and they don't know how to take care of them. No, are you serious? Like, this was the idea. You were going to be... Yeah, this, that's what I was going to do at some point. I just didn't do it. Somebody can still do it and run with it. Yeah, it's but it's a business, business idea. idea that works. Yeah. I'm telling you the truth. I don't mind sharing. <laughs> you know. Yes. Because I buy blue shoes, but my people at home don't know how to take care of blue shoes. Then they fade after three days. And you can't wear them anymore. But the shoe is still nice. You're really passionate about this idea. Maybe you should pursue it. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so now my plans was I just needed to be independent. Okay. I was tired of asking for money from my parents every month. And I just needed to be myself in my own house, making my own decisions. And so that's what I was waiting for. You were not going to be a clinician. Or however you are going to be independent. I, I, I was passionate about my practice. Yeah. I could not wait to start practicing. I mean, I could not wait to do that cesarean section on my own. Okay, so tell yes. us about that. So now you go to internship. So I, I go get a bed sitter in Kiambu town, small room. I don't have a mattress. Then I realize, whoa, university really spoiled us. I forgot that even that mattress I used to sleep on wasn't mine. So I only had that carpet I bought with my first help, a box and carton of books, my computer, my TV card. 
my beddings. And that's how I started life. In all honesty, I actually slept on the floor for a week on my carpet. In a reality, I'm not saying this to please anyone. You understand? Then I bought a bed, a mattress later, then a bed came later. And so I start life, then we get posting orders. I go to Kiambu District Hospital. And finally, when I to a doctor, and I never felt so proud in my lab coat. I had this very nice fitting lab coat, custom made for me, Dr. Okot M.O. M.O.I, medical officer intern. I never felt proud like that in my life. It's the way you watch the movies of an American army and saluting each other. It's the pride of serving your country with everything you have. It was the best period of my life. So I start with OBS guy, because I just needed to know how to open the abdomen and release a child out. And they come out crying. Because from there you'd know how to suture, you'd know how to resuscitate, and you'd know how to take care of the medical conditions. And so yeah, I started with maternity. First night you're called in the gyne ward and you have about 10 MVAs to be done from Madare. And you can't sleep and you're just like this, you know. But you have to save a life because some of them come gushing blood. so amazing that working 36 hours, you could not realize you were worked for 36 hours. And so I did it so well that when all the nurses in Kiambu had patients, they would send them to me. I was an intern, and I could take care of the OCS. I could take care of the magistrate. When they came, they looked for Dr. Okoth. You know. And I dedicated my time to the surgeon that every time they were going to theater, I would go there with them because I wanted to learn how to do these things. And so that really worked to my advantage when I later opened my practice because I could almost do the whole spectrum. Things have changed nowadays. It's not the same anymore. But also to give you feedback, as also an employer of doctors, I see a lot of half-baked doctors being churned out there because their attitude does not allow them to go and learn. We get doctors who cannot even suture, a doctor who cannot even place an IUCD. You understand? Something needs to change. And you seated here today, more than anything else, please take your internship with the seriousness it deserves, because that is what make, differentiates a doctor and a quack doctor. Today, a doctor is not the certificate. It's your practice. And there are patients I saw 10 years ago who still call me to date because you have to put in the work. That is what separated. And that's how when we started Roy Family Hospital, there are, our clients were loyal and are still loyal. Actually, the most loyal clients are the ones we started with. I get messages that, Mimi nilianza na nyinyi mkiwa kwa ile, unaona uko welkim kwa stage. That's what they tell you. Because they've seen you grow, and they've seen how you've served them. When it grows, it becomes bigger because it's not about you anymore. It's multiple of other people who don't share the dream, but you still have to be there to fix it, right? So my request for you guys is please, your internship is a make or break. Paperwork is here and there to give you the, it's like a map, you know. But that map is a blueprint of a drawing that needs to come up, of the building that stands out. So your internship is what makes you who you are. It's what makes you as a doctor. Then after that, everything falls in place. Because I realized after internship, I would have understood Ganong better. Right? There are things that were now making sense that were not making sense. I, I was probably cramming them then just to pass examination. And so your practice is much more important than anything. Okay, the bookwork sets the foundation because you cannot reach that practice without your bookwork. But please, if you get to your internship, don't be those people who pass by. Ali Peter Kienda, you know, be there on the ground. I think there's something important to be said about your journey and how anyway how Jabahatisha, you there's you can see a string of just um, a real commitment to do well for yourself. Um, why, why are you not here? <laughs> yeah, I mean a, a real um, commitment to be a person of integrity. You know, the lesson you learned in form one about cheating. Um, and I think it's important for us young people sitting here to know that there's no shortcut. This thing you actually have to work hard for. Um, so when we see Dr. Okot sitting here looking shiny, there's been a process. So I think, 
I think that's something more young people need to be told about, just the process and the, the, the facts of the matter, um, that, that, that this just doesn't happen. Um, it's been years um, in the making. And so maybe now we could jump into now bathing the vision of RFH. Um, so you told us about your internship experience and sleeping on the floor, we believe you slept on the floor. And then um, I think a big part of your story is your, um, like how you see entrepreneurship as solving a problem. You're not just trying to make money. Um, the thing is solving a problem. So maybe now, how do we go from internship to where we see, okay, there's a problem here that I can solve, and then figuring out how to, how to solve it. Um, and it's good you've said that. Um, nothing comes easy. One day I hope to write a book of the journey that has been to what RFH is today. The broken dreams, the anxiety disorders, the depression to deal with. You know, and there are things I would never wish to go back into. But there's no shortcut, I tell you. I tell my staff every day, if I come with this car, don't think I just got it today. It has been a process. Even for the dealer to trust me to give me a car and give me a plan to pay for it. Your name is everything more than anything else. That's number one. Um, if you enter anything with the idea of making money, you will fail. And that I will tell you. You will fail and fail terribly. Solve a solution and the money will follow you. But if you enter with making money, you will thoroughly flop. And flop to a point you cannot be helped. You'll have buried yourself. So how is it bathed? So I'm an intern. And in my gyne clinic, we see women coming in with fibroids. And they're symptomatic and bleeding. But the saddest part is we tell them we have to book you for theater and the booking list is as long as two years down the line. Truth. And you talk to the people in surgical rotation and they tell you their booking list is three years down the line. So what does that tell you? There's a problem, right? Why can these people seek these services somewhere? Is it that there are no hospitals, sorry? Or is it that the hospitals that are there, they cannot access them? And I asked myself, what does it cost to set up a surgical theater? What does it cost to have an ultrasound machine? Because we could send patients for lab tests outside the hospital for uh, UECs, full, uh, UECs, LFTs, lipid profiles, because in Kiambu town there are a lot of diabetics and hypertensives. And that was a baseline study for them every month. And they would spend a lot of money. And I say, there's a problem here. And so I say, I have to set up something. Because these people cannot wait for two years. If you call them after two years, they'll probably be dead. So somebody has to sort them somewhere, right? The reason why was we had one theater at that point, And our maternity was busy. So when you have fibroids and you have a mother in fetal distress, which one comes first? Fetal distress, right? So you'll keep pushing these surgeries until they become an emergency. So either you have a stab wound or a ruptured appendix or a, uh, or a bust ovarian cyst or, you know, that's when they will find theater. Otherwise, they will never find theater. And so that's where the idea to set up RFH comes in. And my mother had just lost her job at that point. The bank was retrenching and downscaling in their staffing. And I know she had her terminal due somewhere. And so I approached her and asked her, I didn't tell her I want to start a business because um, my, my parents are the traditional parents. I mean, work hard, go to master's, become a consultant. I remember when I was running at Roy Family and we were struggling those days. You're like, why are you struggling? We go and queue to see doctors for 3,000 and I'm seeing 20 patients in that queue. You'd be making that money, you know. I said, everyone has a roll card for them. So I borrow money. I want to buy a piece of land in Kitengela. I had this dream to own my own house at that point. I remember in fourth year and fifth year, we had these architectural drawings 
we had downloaded from the internet and you say, one day I'll own a house of my own. It was such a dream that I wanted to have a house of my own. And so I say, first I have to buy land, right? So me and my friend Peter, who was my roommate for the longest time, we looked for some pieces of land in Kitangela. They were owned by the museum circle or something, being sold for 400000 And so <clears throat> I approached my mother, who has money somewhere. She has no idea what to do with it. She was not business-minded at all. She was stuck up in the bank for all those uh, uh, 25 years or something. You understand? Day and night, morning to evening, weekends except Sunday. So you don't even know what opportunities are there. Now you have these final deals in an account and you're trying to figure out. And you see, that's how people lose it because you are all over trying to look for an opportunity. Remember, she went and built a very big house in the village that would probably give you rental income and return on investment didn't make sense. And I remember telling her and she could be like, I know what I'm doing, you know. Yeah, we, we laugh about it every day today. So um, I borrow, and lucky, funny enough, I don't know how it works, she gave me that money. So I paid half in Kitangala and I started looking for a place. And so I was, the, the idea was either to go to a pipeline or why. The Eastern Bypass had just been built, and so I find myself in Ruai and fall in love with Ruai for the first time. I pay the deposit. Did the you next know time. the area? Why Ruai? Why, why were those the options? So, pipeline was very heavily densely populated. Okay, so it was a strategic. It was a strategic. Okay. Ruai was not a place I knew. But my wife today, who was my girlfriend then, the father had just bought land in Ruai. And so she knew of Ruai and told me, there's no hospital there. And so I said, let me check it out. And that's how I ended up there. And I saw Akitengela coming up, a Rongai place coming up. said, I want to grow up with this place. And that's how I ended up there. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, and, and I think the topic of funding, a lot of the questions were how do you get capital? And maybe we'll talk about that okay. later after you tell us about your process. But then, um, so how do we go now from zero to one and then onwards to now in terms of yeah, so where do you, and, and a lot of the questions were also about the process of how do you set up a facility. Um, a lot of people also wanted to know at what point in their career, how far after internship, um, and just drawing from your own experience. Um, I think you got lucky because of, I mean, that was kismet in terms of your mom just have, have that happening at that point. Um, but I think you can also create luck. Uh, but... Yeah, just talk, talk us through that with lessons relevant to today. I, I read this book, um, The Alchemist, and it says, if you want something so bad, the universe always conspires to give it up to you. And that thing has been a manifestation in my life for the longest time. I dreamt of a home. I built my first home at 26 and it's not a small house, then. I mean, you need to first desire to have it, then work towards having it. What right? other books should we read? Yes? What other books should we read? There are very many books, <laughs> yes. So I think that really pushed me. And uh, when you put the works into it, you get the results. But it's never easy, to be honest with you. There's always luck. But luck follows the people who desire the luck, right? Otherwise, had I not thought of setting up, I mean, there are people in my class who would have borrowed a million shillings and they would have been given. You understand? My class had people coming with Mercedes Benzes and everything else. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I would wish my son to go to school with a Mercedes Benz one day. It gives you the confidence, but train him the right direction, right? But he needs to know that what does he use that car to benefit him? You get the difference? So it's not luck. Me, my mother losing the job was actually a misfortune because from there, I started taking care of my brother who follows me immediately. I could pay his school fees and pay his accommodation in campus. And I did that for the one who follows him. And then after that, he took over to my sister and then now our last born. We are all doing that. So it actually came with a burden. 
but you need to think that I want this. The more capital you have, the high chances of failure you get. Why so? When you have minimal resources, your decisions are much more measured than when you have a lot of resources. You get the difference? So today, for example, you want to start an online telecommunication, e-commerce, no, not e-commerce, you want to start a telemedicine platform as a doctor, right? What do you need? You'll say, I don't have capital. It's a fallacy. The problem is not capital. The problem is the goodwill and the idea. Capital is never a problem to start a business. So those people who are having capital as an excuse, you're just being an escapist. Right? How do I design a telemedicine application? I will look for that code or designer. Everybody's looking for money one way or another, right? He will quote for you. You say, me, I have half of that money, which you don't have. And you go, right? He will think twice. I mean, that thing, what does he use? He, use his he uses his brain, right? It's like an architect. What resources do they use? It's their brain and time they've put to gaining that whatever, right? Let the architects know, take me wrong. I have nothing again. They also say, what does a doctor use except the brain, right? So he will call you later and say, boss, a third of that man, you have started the process. When you need that a third, you will raise it. You get the difference? Yes. So we start with 200, 300,000, I rent a two-bedroom house where rent is about 10,000 a month. Pay deposit 10,000. You understand? Then I go and realize we need seats. Say so I will not buy seats. So we go and buy wood. We create a bench. What do we do? We clad the bench with foam and the pleather. You see these two pleather-ish thing, like those ones. And that's how it becomes our reception seat. Then I need a reception desk. What do we need? Oh, MDF. We buy MDF, we join them in there, and then we have a reception. Then we create the shelves for the pharmacy. Then the next thing, I need a lab. So we start ordering the lab microscope. I got someone who brought them one by one in my house and accumulated them. Today, the capital this is, is too much. He will be the 300,000? Yes, we're doing okay. Right. And are you seeing patients? Is this, are no, you we are setting up. Revenue? We are setting up. So no patients patient No yet. patients yet. Okay. Yes, okay. we are setting up. And so we do everything, then along the way, I'm run out of cash. So the initial place to get capital in a business is the three Fs. It's called friends, fools, and family. Right? It's only a stupid person who will give you money without collateral and doesn't know where you're going to put it. Right? So in this case, I got family who is my mom. Then friends who was my girlfriend at that point when money ran out. I talked to her. I don't know how these women save money, but she had 100,000 in an account somewhere. In campus, you know, 100,000 at that time was like 600 or 700,000 today. I don't know how, but yes, she gave me, and that's why I'll be loyal and I'll stick by her by rain or sunshine, right? So, so you get that and you fill the gap. Someone asked how to find a life partner, how to find a life partner, attitude. <laughs> attitude more than anything else uh, I, when I interview my staff I look for attitude number one when you want a life partner look for attitude very what is the name of that song <laughs> you know yes uh, you know <laughs> so you look for attitude first people who you sure will not change and they are genuine she she had the chance to date the richest kids in school, but she chose this reggae boy because probably she saw the dream. You understand? And she so stood by him. The girls should see the dream, guys. Yes, so <laughs> don't look for ready-made. Look for the future, right? Yes, date, so date potential. You're telling them to date potential. Potential. <laughs> that's, what the, the, I don't know. that's what we don't know today. Look for the potential, right? So not ready-made. Somebody who has a passion and a desire inside to make it and then hold each other's hands i'd prefer i said if i don't get my wife in campus i'll probably not marry because i thought deep inside i was going to be successful at some point and i hated the fact that the women then would love me 
for what I had and not me. Right? And so I said, let me lock this, Saeem. Mapeman, your best, right? <laughs> <laughs> so finish now, and then Kesi Badai. So yeah, that's, that's what I did. And um, I think marrying Ali also helped me. How old were you? I mean, we left campus and moved in. And that's how things went. So like 24, 25? 25, yes. Wow. Uh, yeah, along the way, you're a man trying to find yourself. You do mistakes here and there. At least she was, she was, she was loyal to me. She, was been, she stood by me, stood some of my bullshit. Until now, I sobered up and say, now I need to, you know. Yes. That's life. Okay. <coughs> Back to funding. Back to funding. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, she topped up and then we opened our doors. You buy medicine here for Kidogo, 10,000. Lab reagents here, Kidogo, Kidogo. Today, the capital, if you're thinking my advice will help you set up a hospital or a clinic, you're lying to yourself. The game has changed. The license for laboratory alone is 300,000. Right? So things are different. <laughs> you understand? Then, it was, I think, 10,000 or 15,000 there about, right? Yeah, so a lot of things have changed. The ball game is different. So what happens? You change with circumstances. Partnerships are hard, but how about you come together, five or six of you, like-minded people. You have known each other for six years. You understand? You have seen this guy does not wash utensils, but I can stand him. This one knows how to cook. This one sleeps during discussions. You know. <laughs> yes. So you know each other. But don't go out there and start t taking partners for people you don't know. You will cry premium tears. Did you consider taking partners? Or had you I, had the experience My experience from, oh, with okay. the Tomon 10 idea cut that idea for partnerships completely for me at that time. So you're the sole proprietor of RFH? I was, then I sold 10% to okay. a friend later on, I think after five, six years, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh -huh. you're, you're telling us about the process of setting up and then getting your employees. And, and all this time you're still an employee of government. Yes, yes, I'm still working for the government. So I was an employer. So I had a CEO, a nurse, a clinician, uh, a lab tech. And so I would only come to supervise them on weekends. And boss, they showed me dust. They would steal like there's no one's business. <laughs> so I would withdraw money from my ATM to pay them with my salary when they have already paid themselves. I was thin like a mosquito. How and I could not sleep. How did you deal with that? Uh, you know, after internship, I was posted to Nyeri. So I was running a business from Nyeri to Nairobi via remote control, and they would send me messages every day. Today, we've done this. We've seen this number of patients. But, boss, there were lies. Because <coughs> on weekends, you're there, you see 20. They tell you they saw five or four. And they did some very bad things as well. You know, some of them, in their thirst to make money, they would do, you know, crazy stuff. You know. And so I had to find a way to come back to Nairobi. So I really hustled with the ministry to find my way back. And so when, when uh, Uhuru was launching free maternity, they needed extra doctors in Pumwani. And voila, I found myself in that list because the secretary at Afia was so how determined I kept knocking that door every day. I remember there's a time one person told me, you cannot work in Nairobi because of your name. Yes, that's a country we have built for ourselves. But again, I said, if you want something, God finds a way to open the doors for you. So I found myself back in Nairobi, so I would monitor and supervise much easier. And things changed slightly from there. Then we realized where we were was not very, was not the best. And so we needed to look for a better place. And that's how we moved to where the current Roy family is. It was just a one-story building. Yeah, the landlord finished it for us. Then that time I applied for a loan from Youth Fund because... One thing when you start a business, you must show your cash flows. And so I used, I, somebody who helped me was somebody who told me, bank everything you make. Even if you're banking it here and withdrawing it here, right? So I could bank everything. And I was surprised when I withdrew our first statement. I saw tens of millions in a I'm like, whoa, you know, these things have passed through my hands. But you know, it's a 5,000, 2,000, 1,000. And that financial knowledge nobody teaches, as in medical school. And so I started putting my books and records, and so I could get a loan. And so I went to Youth Enterprise Fund. People said, this government thinks you can't get them unless you know anyone. If 
funnily enough, I just went, I didn't know anyone, applied. Using the title deed for that land I bought in Kitangela as collateral, we got 1.8 million. And that was what made us now start from an outpatient to a 10-bed maternity hospital. And the story is never the same moving forward. I hope everyone's picking the lessons. This is not one of those, he's not giving points. Um, but I think a big part of your journey is just the, the thought that you can. You know, you have the audacity, like you think you can. <laughs> so I think guys have the audacity. Whatever it is you think you can do, um, what your mind can conceive, you can do, right? Um, and, and just the thing of not seeing obstacles, the thing of... Um, Capital is not a reason. Not having capital is not a reason to not start a business. And I think there's so many other obstacles we put on ourselves, but really, if they don't exist in your mind, they don't exist in life, right? So I, now, maybe I think we can go now to a more, I think we've got the story, at least in its skeleton form. We'll read the book when it comes out, please. Yes. It needs to come out. Um, but what do you think? has equipped you the most for, and you, I know that ja that th thinking of you can is a yes. big part, but what has equipped you the most for your journey? I think entrepreneurship in this country, and especially in healthcare, is really a sport. Um, so what's been maybe three or four things that have been? Um, it's not a sport, it's an extreme sport. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, there are days I've thought and entertained the thought of committing suicide, as sad as it sounds. In all honesty, in the public world, you're seeing yourself as, people are seeing you as very successful, you're winning awards, but deep inside here, you're a crushed, broken person, just literally living the day at a time. Got myself into alcohol, a lot of it, and I would drink and drink. And those are days I never wish for anyone. And on a Sunday, I never knew for four years how a weekend looked like. Because I was either in bed nursing a hangover, or I'm very stressed and sleeping. And that's a journey of business. It's not a bed of roses. And you take every bullet that comes your way, even for things done by people who you have no control about. First, my closeness to God has really been very fundamental to me. And it gives me hope every day that there's somebody somewhere watching over me. Even when the most powerful people come and they want to bring you down, there's a God in heaven who will stand by you. Because as long as you do the right thing, he will be there for you. But other than that, what also equipped me is education. I've never stopped learning. Oh, I didn't finish uh, development finance, as someone said I dropped out because I just hate feeling stupid. I entered that class in Strathmore. And I could not understand what those people were saying. And so I dropped out. Yes, so that's life. Sometimes know what you can and what you cannot. That is a lesson you need to take. Um, I, I always want to equip myself more. I think going with the Stanford Seed program really helped me. How to package a business, look at the value chain, uh, look at your value preposition, look at your strengths, your channels, you know. Uh, your customer value add, uh, who are your stakeholders. And so it made me now package the business into a corporate scenario. And once you do that, then you become fund ready. So with that, we were able to fund it and package it so well that after that, when we started raising funds, we went to a South African fund that gave us 100 million shillings at that point because we had now packaged the business ready for investment. And then from there, we went into local banks and then we got... Uh, institutional investors and we are now looking for more and more and more. So that knowledge of how to run a business is what lacks in medical school. And I think it's a unit that the faculty needs to think about seriously as a unit that everyone needs to be taught because you need it. Today it's obvious that everyone is not going to be employed by the government, right? What option do you have? You run your clinic or you run your practice? The same fundamental Fundamentals of running Safaricom as a business is the same fundamentals of running your kiosk. It doesn't change. It's the scale that changes. So going to school has also been very helpful to me. Uh, my family has been very strong. Had they given up on me at some point? You know, there's that time, uh, I literally would say I was an alcoholic addict. Because you'd 
swear I'm not going to drink the next weekend and you find yourself on Thursday, Friday, Saturday drunk. Yani. But out there you are the life of the party like no one else. Everybody's looking for you where you are, right? But at home no one is happy with you. So they're like, out there you are so jovial when you come here you're always in pain. Usitubebe fala, you know. So that is how people give up on someone and someone goes and goes and finds themselves there. And so my family just being there and holding my hands and standing by me also was very important. A lot of medical entrepreneurs who've been successful, and I will not mention names, if you follow their social life, it's pathetic. You understand? And that's something what, needs what to be What is talked. it about the sector? What really are the challenges that drive people to that level of struggle, especially in healthcare? And then how did you get out of that? I think that's relatable. Uh, you know, first and foremost, as a doctor, you are forced and trained into your line of duty and nothing else. What helped me was a bit much more social. So I had friends outside my medical cycle. I know just, I have very few medical friends that we hang out every day. They are friends, yes, but more of acquaintances. So my everyday, everyday friends are not medics. So at least I have a view of other things other than medical. But in the medical field, it's a competition. We're always competing. Who's better and who's going to bring the other down? And it's just you pull one another down and one another down. And, uh, and so your biggest enemies are actually people around you. And that eats you up, right? And we need to change. We need to be like lawyers. We need to ensure that when one of our own shines, then we all shine, right? But that's not us in the medical sector. When a patient goes to the other, ah, this person did wrong in one, two, three, four, because you want to look better. No, that's not how to be a doctor. How to be a doctor is yes, do the right, but also you have to pass the message definitely without making the other one look bad. Because I'm always better and the other one is bad. That is what this profession is. Then in medicine, running a hospital being an extreme sport is because you're dealing with everything and anything that entire sectors of the world has. You have drivers, you have cooks, you have chefs, you have public relations officers, you have communication, you have logistics, you have a pharmacy, you have a lab. Then you have patients who don't want to pay sometimes, and when they don't pay, they run to social media, but you can't tell the world that they had this condition and they did not pay because there's patient confidentiality. And then you go to the board, and the board also wants sometimes to look politically right, and they will also side and make vague decisions, but that vague decision can be used against you, and now you're here begging the patient, oh, please, what? But you have a reputation to keep. Boss, at what point do you have a right of your own? You understand me? And it sucks you and brings you down every day, every day, every day. And you don't have a right. So even as we look forward to setting up practices, it is not a bed of roses. It is not easy. Right? I mean, the big hospitals today have no individual owner. You get the difference? But you are here standing, and the entire weight is on your shoulders as one person. And moreover, you don't have a godfather or anyone who stands by you. You're on your own. And a lot of people think you're very successful, yet you're struggling here with debts. You understand? And they want to be like you. So they want to pull you down so that they take your position. Little do they know I can give it to them free of charge and tell them, please take. <laughs> you know, I am tired. And so that's the difference. The big, I, I mean, the big hospitals that we know are either faith-based or mission or a group of something. There's no single person, right? If you go to doctors who set up big practices, more often than not, some of them were overwhelmed and they gave up. And that's why some hospitals don't grow to a certain level. Because you realize, let me go build rentals and collect rent and live in peace. Right? These are the realities. Thank you. Thank it you is what sharing. it is. So all of you who want to be hospital owners, just know this is what's coming. But then, so has it gotten easier? Have you developed problem-solving frameworks? How did you cope with the mental health? I mean, it must get easier. Do you get better at what uh, you do? I just realized that I needed to love myself first more than anything else. I shed out the bad energy around me. I finish work, go home, play with my children. I stopped drinking completely. Yes, I did. Uh, I feel better, I'm more energized, I'm more encouraged. I've become more closer to my sons and daughter. Uh, 
focused on work, setting systems and places, holding people accountable so that they know it's not me, but it's them. Today, if you do anything wrong, I will report you to the council. Who said it's only patients who can report people to the council? So if you come and work for me tomorrow and you mismanage a patient, I will be the first one to write a letter to the council. So that we all take responsibility, right? I mean, you can't do a surgery and leave a goes and expect people to take responsibility for you. You know their goes count. Why didn't you do goes count? The hospital will not take responsibility for you. You have to take responsibility for yourself. And so we need to hold everyone accountable. 